May I now request the National Security Advisor to the Prime Minister of India, Shri Ajit Duval, to address us. Sir. Governor Janab Arif Mohammad Khan Sahib, Shri Hardi Puri, Shri Ram Bahadur Ji, Shri Pai, Shri M J Akbar, and Ham Sab ko, jinhone introduce karaya Shri Nirpendra Mishra Ji. He has been a great colleague. I thank him for all his kind words. But let me tell you, the man who deserves no introduction, but is too well known, is one of the most efficient and effective bureaucrats that I had known in my career. We had the pleasure of working together, sitting in adjacent rooms in South Block, and I really miss those wonderful days. But anyway, he had been doing much more useful, and I'm happy that he has contributed something in the process of making this Ram Mandir that we. The country is really proud of. <laughs> Shri M J Akbar has been a great friend whom I have known for decades. I don't have to tell what a great book he writes. That all that he has written is something which is a very permanent contribution to the great literature from various points of view. Its intellectual depth, the well research that it goes. His ability to look at the things from entirely a new perspective and give us a lot of plenty of food for thought. His this latest book on Gandhi: A Life in Three Campaigns. I have not been able to read it fully. It is so riveting that whenever I opened any page, one didn't feel like keeping it down. But then the compulsions demanded that well, probably I couldn't read. But I am going to just finish it. But I have read parts of it. And I was deeply impressed by that. He has got a very unique style of expressing himself. It comes so straight. There's a very straight and a simple logic that has got a great intellectual depth, and it is so convincing. He portrays Gandhi not what was being seen on the surface of the things that was happening and the way that he was contributing, but what was. Happening underneath at a subterranean level of Gandhi as a person, how his personal life was evolving and 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 was taking place. The events in his life are taking place when all these major events, the three campaigns of Satyagraha and all these things were going on, the Namakandol and others. But then there was something as much as as uh, important and as the things that was happening in Gandhi's personal life and the way his thinking was getting evolved. He is also a great observer of human behavior, and you could also see that how the personal attributes, how the personal thinking, how the personal compulsions add to the complexities of the life, and how did it affect the political thinking and the ways of life of Gandhi, including his belief systems. He starts his book, and which I was deeply impressed with, about the Hindu Swaraj, which taught gospel of love. In place of hate, non-violence instead of violence, and challenges brute force with force with soul force. British called it seditious and banned the book. And the author says that that is what added to its popularity and made it much better known than it would have otherwise been. But now I look at it from different point of view. There is a setting, and it is a colonial setting in which there is a mighty British power, and I think it is one of the most glaring example of a fight of asymmetric powers, what we call today as an asymmetric warfare. Asymmetric, asymmetric warfare is that what does a weaker partner fight the war, and what are the chances of his success? Against a much powerful adversity, probably Gandhi was a great strategician. 
he could understand and he could just think that in this asymmetrical war, probably his tools will have to be different. After Second World War, as late as this, that people started realizing that the brute force, if it has to be countered, whether there could be other alternatives. And in 90s, the concept of the soft power emerged with Joseph Ney telling and being applauded as the great founder of a new theory of power. In our power is your ability to affect your adversary in the way that you want it to be affected. If I want you to do something and you can do what I want you to do, that is the power that I wield over you. Second war and the wars before and after that started proving that the military power, the brute power, is the most cost and effective instrument of achieving your political objectives. Whether the Americans could try it in Vietnam or in, in, or in um, uh, Afghanistan or the uh, Soviet Union in Afghanistan and others. They were asymmetric powers, but they found that the lesser power were able to vanquish them. But there are very few examples where the soft power has been able to dominate the hard power of an asymmetry, in, a, in an asymmetric warfare. Now, Gandhi was a very perfect practitioner of that. He could, he could realize that his moral force, what we call as a soft power today, is your moral force, the force and power of your culture, your civilization, your values and others, that would be able to defeat and vanquish a much more powerful hard power. And now, increasingly much more research and work is being done about how do the great powers start becoming the dominant power by exercising the soft power. And this actually started when in the 90s it appeared that there, will be, there may be a decline of the major powers with the Soviet Union disintegrating and the United States emerging as a single power but being dominated increasingly by the emergence of the new power centers. And that is the time when Joseph Ney came out with this thing that, no, the United States would be able to remain afloat and remain buoyant in this power game because of this soft power, and it can multiply its soft power. And in that came the various variants of that. Now look at it. Let us take the scenario of the 20s in India, when there's a mighty British power which has got the power of its army, its police, its laws, its judiciary, it, the entire global this thing was under its control and there was a man with no resources to match it. He had nothing. That is the time when he thought that if he, he could mobilize the moral soul, the moral power, the soul power as he called it, and make it an instrument of, uh, weaponize it, Weaponizing your power of your uh, moral strength to defeat a mighty empire. Probably to most it would have looked imp impossible, even in much later uh, decades. But even at that time, the fact that he had the faith and he had the confidence that it can challenge and it can achieve what he wanted to achieve against his adversary. Today it may look to us something we take it for given because this has happened in history. Probably after that it happened in South Africa. So there will be a couple of other examples that followed. But there are very few examples, at least I could find none, where the soft power of that time could this thing as, as mighty a power as the British Empire is and so effectively. He not only fought it effectively, but he won it. And this power game itself is a matter which probably is a matter of research. If somebody could write the district of Gandhi about my experiments with soft power and then redefine what Joseph Ney and the various stream of philosophers thereafter had talked about the soft power and not only the soft power, the modern version of it is which is coming as a smart power. That is, you combine the soft power and the hard power in such a permutation combination, alternations and different combinations, that is, you are able to achieve the optimum result. I'm not very sure how much Gandhi really consciously 
was fully opposed to the people who were exercised the, the hard power. He did not support them. He did not stand by them. But probably he was not that much against Bose. Let it coexist. He was not also against probably some of the revolutionaries. He did not approve their ways, but he did not condemn them, both for their intent and for this thing. It added that soft power blended with this hard power actually became the India's smart power. And it has this India's smart power that in the post uh, um, uh, war period, the Britishers thought that probably with so many Indians who had returned victorious after the Second World War and probably were resentful because of the Gandhi's message and the Gandhi's thing that they had changed the, the, um, the, the, the whole thinking in the country, that these troops may not remain as loyal to them as the, the Britishers thought them to be. And therefore, with their prizing in Karachi, this thing, then in Jawalpur and in other places, when the small, small things started and the INS things started coming up, that combination of hard power and small soft power which became the India's smart power of that time, which eventually was responsible for its victory against an adversary. So what a great strategician and what a great warrior he was of his time, who could think straight, who could think something much beyond his times, and who could effectively use that power so effectively against a very, very mighty power. So I think this is a very great tribute to this thing. And this the idea comes out of Mr. Akbar's book when we go through that and we see that how in his very, very inimitable way and very, very ordinary way, how could he achieve those extraordinary results? And what a great warrior and what a man, great man of conviction he was. The same thing comes out when we see about how his belief system was, was shaping his ideology, was shaping his political choices and the preferences that he made and the decisions that he took. So I think this is the time to pay tribute, of course, to the great Mahatma who, uh, uh, who, who took this country not only to its independence, but gave it an identity of which we all are proud today. But I must also say that it's a great tribute to Mr. Akbar's uh, this thing today that he's written a book on Mahatma, which probably you all will enjoy reading. It's a very, very enjoyable reading. It's something that we probably can draw various lessons in the way that we want. And I must congratulate once again the publishers and the author for the great book and uh, this thing that he has written. All the best to you, Mr. Akbar.